All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as you can see, we have a, a room full of students and mentors who are ready to show you what they have been working on. Uh, my name is Servan de Mol. I'm the founder and executive, executive director of Code for Fun. Um, and Hack High School is one of the programs that we offer at Code for Fun. So just a few words on why did we decide to create Hack High School about four, four or five years ago? Well, uh, we wanted to provide an opportunity for students in high school um, to be able to discover and deepen their, their knowledge in computer science. A brand new report that uh, just came out a few months ago showed there's, a, there's barely a majority, a very slim majority of high school offering computer science as a course, uh, 51%. And so we know that if uh, you could mute yourself, just um, make sure that you stay muted. Uh, so we have a we have about forty percent of the students who are going to go through K twelve without ever taking a computer science class, and in today's world we think that this is not acceptable. That uh, the students need to at least know what's what are the tools that they are interacting with, um, and so we want to make sure that we provide this. Um, so High Cat School was created a uh, few years ago. We want to discover the students. Um, we want to let the students discover computer science, but we also want to do it in a different style than what they could experience in high school. Um, we want them to actually learn from one another, uh, to work in groups. And so this, uh, this particular semester, they have actually created a project together, um, in groups from varying from two people to four people. And uh, we are pairing them a mentor. Uh, we also want to provide them an opportunity to work with mentors who are actually in the fields of computer science, uh, who can be a role model for them and, uh, and can be uh, sharing a little bit their experience uh, being, um, uh, being in the computer science field. Uh, so some alumni that we have uh, in our project program uh, Linnea Lever was uh, joined uh, computer the joined High High School in 2018 as a ninth grader, um, and she uh, really wanted to actually write uh, um, the APCSP test. Um, she uh, she studied with her. We were uh, helping students to be able to independently join and and pass the APCSP, uh, and she. Um, uh, she was really happy to be able to have uh, mentors who could help her uh, create uh, some project that she's really interested in. Uh, Violeta Durga was um, um, an 11th grader uh, student, and uh, she actually uh, was trying to, use, to learn computer science all by herself and find it difficult, but as soon as she joined uh, Hakai School, uh, she was able to do in three months what she was not able to do in two years. Uh, she actually um, joined a congressional app challenge uh, in, uh, in, in that year, and uh, she created an app called Inspectigo that was helping um, companies like uh, the one that her dad was having, uh, which is a termite inspection company, to basically schedule and report better on their work that they're doing. And then we have Kabir, Kabir, so this is, uh, you know, only three of the numerous students that we have. Kabir joined us uh, in 2019 when he was in ninth grade. He stayed two years at high school um, as a student. And then after that, he agreed to be a mentor. The first, uh, uh, the second part of the 10th grade uh, and 11th grade, he actually created some curricula for us. And then this year, he was actually one of our mentors. So we have Kabir. Uh, with us today and some of his uh, students. Thank you. Um, and uh, we uh, we also very happy to know that uh, Kabir has been accepted to go to Cornell for next year. So congratulations, Kabir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so high school brings a lot of value to your students. 
if you calculate the number of hours that they are spending on the project and the opportunity, you know, if you're trying to go and find that on the market, um, you will, you know, you will end up paying something like eight hundred or thousand dollars for this. Uh, but we want to provide it for free because we want we want to make sure that everybody has access. So if you are in a parent and you are in the the um, if you are able to participate to the tuition, we will gladly accept a donation from you. We are a five hundred one c three company, so all donation are tax free. So if you can participate, that will help us to keep uh, this program uh, free. So don't forget also that um, company matching uh, are a huge help. Uh, so if you are uh, working at a company that match your donation, then make sure that you use this because, you know, twice, three times, sometimes during the giving season, they will, they will match your donation. And that could be a very big help for us. All right, so now it's the time for the students to present their work. Um, we will go first with uh, with uh, uh, Shripada's group, and then we will go with Carter's group, uh, and followed by Misha, and uh, and then Kabir. So as you can see, most of the students were divided into two big uh, uh, region. Uh, one with Python game design, so we have two projects uh, with that. And then two, um, two uh, groups worked on AI. So I will stop sharing and then um, Runak uh, or Ab Abishri, if you can take it over. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our, uh, our Python dev game development presentation. Uh, this project was a culmination of months of uh, brainstorming, research, programming, and collaboration. So hopefully you like our, uh, you like our project. Our team consists of our mentor, Sripada, and, two, uh, and our members, Abhishri and myself, Rana. The project itself is an online arcade in which the user can choose two different any of one of two different games that they can play. The two games are Tic Tac Toe and Dark Balloons. Tic Tac Toe is a popular is a popular three by uh, is a popular game where you have a three by three board and and the objective is basically to make three uh, make a three X's in a row or three O's in a row and whoever does that wins. And Dark Balloons is a common a common shooter game where you try to shoot uh, where you try to shoot uh, shoot balloons moving your mouse on the screen. And now I'll be demonstrating. Uh, I'll I'll be demonstrate. I'll be giving you a live demonstration of our project. So as you can see, when we when we run this when we run the program, we can see the arcade screen pop up, and it gives you three options: tic tac toe, dart balloon, or exit. If you want to exit, so if I press tic tac toe, uh, you can see the tic tac toe board over here, and I get the it starts with X. X playing first, and then you can go with X and O's. And as you can see, if so, if someone wins, it draws a straight line indicating that so, indicating that the game is over and X is one in this case. Uh, for the for the code in the tic tac toe game, uh, the main main pro, uh, main library we used for this project was PyGame, but, but we've also uh, but I, we've also used NumPy, Math, and uh, Sys for uh, for different uh, different purposes within our code. As you can see, this is it's it, it's over two hundred lines of code to create this uh to create this game. Um, there are several different functions, uh, for one for printing the board, for drawing the board, for drawing the different lines you can see in the three by three board, for drawing the X's and O's, as well as for all the conditions and the statements. Um, this project this project uh involved uh involved a learning process and a learning curve. Uh, initially, we tried to uh, we tried to just brute force through the code and like hard code each and every condition to win, but then as we went along with with the help of Sripada, uh, Sripada and the other team members, uh, 
we were able to develop an algorithm for the tic-tac-toe game. So it really involved a good learning process and, and helped, us, uh, helped us on our coding journey. Now, now Abhishri will be demonstrating the, the dart balloon aspect of our project. Thank you, Ronak. I'll start presenting now. So the other game that we have in this game is Dart Balloon. So once we click the Dart Balloon button, a game will pop up of Dart Balloon. So the, the function of this game is basically you move your cursor around and then you, whenever you press on a balloon, a dart hit it and you have a score count. And that happens as long as there's no max score. More in depth about the Dart Balloon game is that Majority of this code, which is 179 lines of code, is all based off of the description of the balloons, um, their color, the features, and the, where they're going to move around. And afterwards, there's also a program that helps with making the cursor move around and follow the mouse. Now, this was a group effort, and, a, and my teammates helped me a lot, and so has my mentor Shree for that, and also that I have used the internet a lot in order to see my um, that my project will be able to work. So continuing this slideshow, we will talk about the technical features of what we've done. The language we've used was Python 3, and the library that we've used was Pygame. The programming features that we've used was PyCharm and Replit, and the collaboration for this project was GitHub. For the teamwork component of our project, each person did their best and dedicated their time and effort to this game. Ronak worked on the tic-tac-toe tic game, and I have worked on the dark balloon game, and Tripla has helped us with all of it. Each week, we pushed GitHub, we pushed our code to GitHub, and we have showed other team members what we've made, and each of us gave revisions on what to do and we have improvised and made changes to our game that way, making our, our um, project a group effort. For the challenges that we've faced, most of our team members have never actually coded in Python before, so learning a new language was very challenging and a new way of perspective for coding. And also, none of us had used a Pygame library before or have developed a graphical user interface. And both of those were challenging, but they were so fun to learn after we've discovered them and learned how to do it. After all, the experience that we got from Hack High School was so much fun. We were able to learn about GUI. We've been able to improve our Python knowledge, and we've learned how to collaborate on GitHub, which would be an important tool for collaboration. This will especially help us for a career in computer science. Now, and most of all, this was a, a project that was very challenging and fun. We thank Hack High School for such a great opportunity and we're very thankful. And also we're very thankful for you to listen to this presentation. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? If you want, you can ask a question into the chat and uh, I will read it out loud to the uh to the students. All right, so um, the next group, um, Kenny, Darcy, Jeffrey, and Sumant. Um, please get ready. Thank you, Abhishri and Runai. This was very great. And thank you, Shripada, for leading the students through these uh, challenging projects. Um, most of you, I think, you know, start Hack High School with no experience in programming. So this is always great to see how much progress you can do in such little time. So good job. All right. Uh, so Kara's group, this is you guys are on. Can you all see this uh, presentation? Yep, good, okay. Um, hi everyone, I'm Carter. Uh, I was uh, the mentor for um, one of the AI projects. Um, 
And so I'm just going to kick it off by introducing us and then I'll um, pass it off to our students to um, go through. So um, I'm Carter Jacobson, as I said, uh, I, this is my, I guess, third semester mentoring with Hack High School, um, made possible by uh, COVID because I live and work in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and I work in quantitative finance, so pretty much coding um, for investment uh, company. And uh, just want to just want to pass on that that my kids, uh, my students chose this project um, of their own volition. So it wasn't uh, wasn't promoted by me, um, but it was helpful. I think that that I had some experience in this field, and so um, you know this was. Uh, Kenny's uh, first time with Hack High School, same with Jeffrey, um, as well as Sumanth. Um, Darcy's been with Hack High School for a few years here um, and a mix of grades for the students. So um, it was really fun to work with them all. And uh, for the presentation today, it'll just be Darcy, Jeffrey, and Kenny um, walking us through this. Sumanth is not with us today. Um, so um, I'll pass it off to, um, I think, Jeffrey starting us off. Yeah, all right. All right, so for our project, um, we have been trying to use data from a list of different companies, specifically from Yahoo Finance, in order to predict um, which stocks will perform better over a given period of time. So um, just like, just um, before we get into any details, before we get into the models, before we get into like the demonstration, um, we, we first wanted to find success for this project. Um, we, in order to evaluate our results, we created um, the hit rate, which is to see whether um, a company does better or like worse compared to the other um, stocks. And I just, uh, just to describe the hit rate to you, it's not necessarily to find um, the highest uh, return, meaning like we, we don't want just, just the highest return. We want the, we want the stock's access return, in other words, what, how it does compared to everyone else. For instance, um, if every company fails, then we want to choose the company that fails the least. Like um and like it's and so that doesn't mean that we're gonna make money basically that just means that it did better compared to everyone else, um and uh, just as a, a good like uh guideline for what we what we were going for it was a uh, fifty percent of a hit rate of fifty percent where the model would like where the model would perform better than the average of the investable stocks and using that we could maybe make our own like it basically tells us whether a stock is investable or not, um. And okay, so we also have a disclaimer here as we do have lower expectations because we, do, we are not paid and we are high school students um, who, and obviously this is a professional thing. So that is a disclaimer, all right. So we worked on this project over the course of a couple months um, beginning in September when we first began gaining experience with implementing machine learning models through Kaggle. Um, and then in October, we decided um, on our project, which involves stocks, as you mentioned before. And so on October 23rd, we began um, gathering financial data, um, like pricing data and return price um, in October um, from Yahoo Finance. And then beginning November, we began processing and cleaning our data um, on November 6th. And then the following week, we chose our two models, our linear regression model and our SVM model. Um, and the following week, we've been training our model. Um, and then on November 27th, we were evaluating our data um, and results using our hit rate. And then on in December, we had our like final results through our predictions. For our project, we used the coding language Python. The libraries we used were uh, Yahoo Finance, Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib, Seaborn, and Scikit-learn. The data and the data source is Yahoo Finance financial statements. Some of the technical challenges we had were that different data, different data from different, we had different data from different companies. The values of data had different ranges. We didn't have a very comprehensive history of data that was available for free, and some of the companies didn't have any data. The solution was data manipulation. We found uh, one of the things we did is we found the common columns for all the data sets, so the model didn't have any empty values. Finding common columns makes sure that each financial data point used is relevant to all the companies. 
We also normalize the data to bring the values closer together. For example, a company like Apple that has large sales and revenues of much larger financial statement data values in a smaller company. Therefore, we normalize the data to bring them closer together for the machine learning model. Finally, we remove the, remove the companies with no data because a lack, a lack of historical data may indicate they don't report their financial statement information on a regular basis, which would make it difficult to invest in them in the future. Uh, one of the models we used was multiple linear regression, which uses multiple independent variables to predict the dependent variable through a linear relationship. The pros, the pros are it's easier to implement, convenient, and time efficient. The cons are it only works accurately with a linear relationship between the dependent variable and the independent variables, and it's prone to overfitting or sensitive to outliers. <clears throat> the graph on the green represents what the model would be good at predicting. And, uh, and this graph would be what the model would have what the model would have a hard time trying to predict. And for the second model that we choose, we, that we chose um, was a support vector machine or SVM model. Um, it is designed to classify distinct outcomes based off of multiple input variables. So basically, if you see in the graph right there, we have two independent variables, like one of the X and one of the Y, and then the dependent variable is actually the colors and the trap, and like the, the different shapes. So um, we're trying to separate the different um, the different uh, different classes. Into, you, know, so you can see that with the line there. Um, like some of, some of the pros of this uh, of this model is that you can do it in high dimensional spaces because you can translate between um, different dimensions. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, for yeah. So you can see here that they have a circle. Like basically, this is like better. This is like the one the same graph with the um, with the with the one before for uh, multiple linear regression. But this one it can work well because it can switch from um, this plane to a 2D plane. Like you can like make it flat almost and then draw a line there. And then um, you can you get a circle. So basically if, if it doesn't make too much sense. It just means that you're, you can, um, so you can um, translate to different dimensions well. And in other words, it's also really good at um, handling different input, input variables as, as our data um, is basically set with. Okay. Um, Another thing it's good with is uh, like a distinguishable separation. Um, and another thing, the other thing that the multiple linear regression uh, struggles with is it's sensitive to LRs, but uh, this but this model is not. Um, however, there are still some cons to this model. Um, one is that it doesn't um, like it doesn't deal well with large data sets like ours. So instead we had to take samples of the test and train data so that it didn't run forever. Um, the second thing is that we didn't, um, it doesn't perform probability estimates. So we had to make our own, which using hit rate, um, which is why we use hit rate in the first place. Um, and the third thing is um, it is not very efficient with overlapping data. Um, basically, uh, when you have an independent variable that has the same value over and over again, um, that is something that Darcy will talk about. Um, but before that, let's, um, can you click on the next? And this is just like a representation of what it would look like, basically. It would like draw a line between it and then when they translate to a different dimension, it would become this like plane. Um, it's kind of hard to explain and honestly, it's hard for me to uh, explain as well. And, but you can kind of imagine that. Um, and honestly, there's ours is like 12 variables, so it's not even possible to imagine. Um, but like, it, it's just like, um, this is how you think about it, All right? So as he mentioned, we used a linear regression model as one of our models um, for trying to predict our from the data. And so this resulted in an average hit rate for five trials at around 49.1%, which is a bit worse than when you if you took all the companies and decided to flip a coin to decide whether or not to invest in, which would be around 50%. So this model doesn't quite work with the data that we had. Um, but as you can see from the example predictions on the right, we can see that the left column predict has the predicted excess return and the right column has the actual excess return. And so um, we can see from the predicted uh, excess return that um, this model does to predict the actual, what it predicts actual values for what the return might be. Um, however, 
again, the hit rate was not ideal as it, it was less than a random hit rate. And so the other model that we used was the support vector model. And so it has the parameter of the gamma value. And so if we increase the gamma value, as you can see from 0 0.01 to 1000, we have um, it increases the hit rate um, increase. And so um, as you can see from our results, we have a total hit rate as well as a buy hit rate. And the buy hit rate is basically that out of all the investments that result in an excess return, um, this is the value which shows the ones that our model would predict right. Um, and we can also see um, the mean company return, which we set to zero, so that we can compare it to the return that we would have um, with the recommended investments by our model. And so you can see that that also increases as our gamma increases. Um, and you can see that with the gamma of 1000, we have a total hit rate of 78.1% um, and our buy hit rate of 71.4%. And these values are really good, like super good. And so you can see how this is kind of a result of like overfitting. Um, and okay, nearing the end of our presentation, I just wanna talk about what we learned from this experience. So uh, the most obvious thing is data collection as we had to take huge files from Yahoo Finance um, into organized orderly uh, CSV files. And this was important because we could do data manipulation, which is another thing we learned. Um, data manipulation is um, basically, I think Kenneth already talked about this, uh, where we had to find common columns, normalization, uh, normalize the data, and then exclude the companies with no data. So those, um, I think, yeah, again, Kenneth talked about that. Um, then there was algorithmic invest investing principles as I said in my pitching slide, um, we had in my pitch slide, not the pitching, okay, my pitch slide, um, we basically had to find not the company with the highest return, but the ones that did better compared to everyone else. And we had to see if those were investable or not. Um, and we also, and for me and uh, uh, others, uh, they, we also found that debugging was extremely useful in this situation because we could uh, see what, what went wrong with coding and what exactly, um, like, like for instance, for the training and testing um, data, we had multiple variables that we to use. Um, and that was a good way for us to see uh, whether a variable was doing what it was supposed to do. If you ask uh, what, well, there's any feature which was particularly dominant in predicting the price? Um, I don't think so. Um, we did have like a list of different columns that we like sorted through to find common ones because we are comparing like all of the different companies. Um, so there was a total of like 1,024 um, that we used to like predict it. So, and I don't think we have an exact one that was the most beneficial because our program just takes them all in and creates a model based on that. I, th I think we could technically find that out though. Like we could run it one by one, but you know, I, I don't know if that's something we want to do. You know, so. I just, as, as the mentor, I can add in that I think, you know, the multiple linear regression makes it easy to do a uh, decomposition of the coefficients to figure out which one was most important. But as we saw the results were, um, you know, the hit rate for, for the multiple linear regression wasn't great. So um, that was sort of difficult. And then, when we go to the SVM, um, you know, I think you can decompose things, but there's also potentially an interaction between the variables that's happening there, which makes it a bit more complex. Um, so, all right. So um, we are going to have um, Naisha, Nikhil, and Kelvin. Are you guys ready for uh, to present? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, Nikhil, Calvin, and I decided to create an AI program that can predict medical insurance costs. So let's, um, we're going to start by introducing ourselves. I'm Naisha, and I'm a high school sophomore in New Jersey. And aside from coding, I also like to listen to music, read books, and I play the flute. Uh, I'm Nikhil DeWitt. I am a sophomore in a high school in the Bay Area. Besides coding, I am an active part of my Boy Scout troop, and I enjoy solving math problems, reading the news, 
and playing and listening to music. I'm Calvin. I'm also a sophomore. I enjoy coding and trying to automate things. I also like reading. Um, Michelle Mubi. So this is the first time I've been uh, mentoring for Hack High School, and it has been really an amazing experience. And uh, currently, I'm pursuing my master's in computer science. And apart from, of course, coding, I also like team challenges, collaborations, and building websites and web applications. So our goal for this project is to predict the medical insurance costs for each patient in a hospital, depending on various factors like their age, the number of children they have, whether or not they're a smoker, um, their BMI, and other factors. This could be useful for health insurers and because it could accurately forecast likely costs and help with their business planning. And it could be useful for um, users of medical insurance who could um, better decide which plan to take and plan their like how they are going to allocate their resources and their money for the upcoming year. So here was our plan. The first step was to clean and pre-process the data. So essentially this involved removing outliers uh, and converting uh, word data to numeric data so it could actually be interpreted by the models. For example, we had data pertaining to different regions and those had to be converted to numbers so the algorithms could interpret it. Then we used exploratory data analysis to visualize the data. So each of us created three EDA graphs, which help us understand how the data related and how different factors such as smoking. So each of us created three EDA graphs uh, that related factors such as smoking to the insurance cost and compared it to other data types, data fields that allow us to analyze what's causing the most increases in the insurance mm -hmm. costs. Uh, then we use the machine learning models. Each of us used a different machine learning model that allowed us to interpret the data and predict and uh, an attempt to predict the cost of insurance. And finally, we evaluated each of the models to determine its accuracy so we could determine which one would best be used in the real world. Application for our project would be to identify factors which affect the cost of medical insurance. Uh, such as the factors mentioned before, uh, age, sex, BMI, whether or not they're a smoker, and also to estimate medical insurance. Okay. okay, so as we worked as a team, we separated the tasks so that we could more efficiently um, accomplish the project. So one of my tasks was to remove null values, and this was important because um, some null values can't be imputed with, you know, the mean or the median, which is usually done. And um, these have to be removed so that they don't harm the performance of the model. Uh, so my task for pre-processing was removing unwanted columns. So this wasn't really needed from the original part for our current project. In our original project, we needed to remove an unwanted column pertaining to patient ID, because if we didn't remove that, the algorithm would interpret it and use it in its model, even though that's really not relevant to the task. Um, we also had to impute missing values as sometimes there are uh, columns which are valuable, but they do have missing values. And so you would want to uh, add in the mean or mode of that column in order to preserve that, in so you can use it for the factor without uh, changing the data. And we also needed to convert categorical data to numerical data because sometimes program is not able to run if there's strings. Um, and that's what categorical, categorical data is. So we need to convert this to integers or quotes. Uh, so now I'm going to be talking about the where. Uh, so then we did the EDA where each of us made three different graphs. So now I'm going to go on to the random forest model. Random forest is a highly effective machine learning model. It essentially consists of multiple decision trees, kind of like a forest of them. Then the model looks at what the majority of the trees predict, and it makes this decision like that. So this is an example of the thing in the image in the top right explains the decision tree. So first it looks at like if the number is red, so then it, if it connect branches out here, 
and then if it's under, it checks if it's underlining. So this represents how a tree works, branching out to determine the appropriate category for it. Each tree looked at different features of the data along the model to determine how to best use the data to determine the result, instead of us having to determine which features are more ideal. Looking at each uh, tree, uh, it looked at what the majority of the trees predicted, and it used that to determine its final answer for the insurance cost. The benefit of using multiple trees is that it allowed us to avoid errors in individual trees. For example, if one tree had a completely unreasonable result uh, for a specific uh, case for some reason, it wouldn't really be counted because there are 99 other trees counteracting it with more appropriate predictions. In this model, we specify here and then estimate this as 100, which means that you are, we are using 100 trees in our prediction. We use two metrics to test the accuracy of our model, a mean squared error and an R2 score. The mean squared error essentially gives us the mean of the score of the difference between the predicted result and the actual result. The R2 score represents the portion of variance in the dependent variable cost that was predicted by the independent variable. This is the primary way we tested the accuracy. When we tested the model on training data, data it had an R2 score of 0.944. This showed that the model was not inherently flawed, as it could at least make good predictions for data that it was trained on. When we tested the model on data we had set out for testing, it had an R2 score of 0.572. Though this is not perfect, this is still a relatively solid score given the amount of fields and limited amount of data. With more data, the model would have likely been more effective, and when this could actually be really applied in the real world, we would have access to like hundreds of thousands of data set of sets of people that would make this model super extremely accurate, allowing to predict for basically every single edge case per, pretty much perfectly. So the regression model that we also decided to use was a ridge regression. And this model uses L2 regularization, which shrinks the coefficients and brings them closer to zero. And that helped avoid overfitting. Overfitting, as you can see in the bottom right picture, is if the data is following, or if the, the model is following the data too closely, so the predictions might not be as accurate. Whereas if you look at a good balance image, there's a, a more general fit so that predictions will be ac accurate. Um, so using ridge regression with our data yielded, as you can see, like 65.255% accuracy. Okay, the uh, model I created was lasso regression. This is a type of linear regression where uh, you adjust for overfitting by uh, including a penalty to uh, each of the features that are, to the features that are less correlated to the, uh, the dependent variable. And it does this by uh, taking the uh, correlation of each of these features and uh, multiplying them by the uh, the data that we're using. And so on the right, you can see the as uh, lambda increases, which uh, corresponds to the aggressiveness of the regularization, it uh, the features that have coefficients Sorry, the coefficients of the features that are less correlated to the data start becoming zero. As you can see on the bottom left, the accuracy of this model was zero point, or the accuracy was 63.29%. And here you can see some of the actual values versus the predicted miles. Uh, so looking at the technical aspect of this, so the language we used was Python, as this is the dominant language used in machine learning. The libraries we used were sklearn, matplot, numpy, and pandas. And the data set we used was actually founded on Kaggle, a medical insurance cost with linear regression. And we collaborated on it using Google Collab, which allowed each of us to add a specific model and edit each other's code and fix for errors. And finally, we stored it on GitHub so it can be accessed by other people interested in looking at our models and our results. So throughout this project, we learned a lot about AI in general and about regression. And so first, 
one of our learning outcomes was um, that we spent a lot of time learning about regression models, which helped us understand and analyze the data better once we chose a data set from Kaibo. Okay, we also learned about different types of data sets and what makes a good data set. For instance, uh, some, some data sets have too many like categorical things that the, the model can't really use accurately. We also learned about the process for creating AI. So choosing the data set, then pre-processing, and then doing uh, EDA, exploratory data analysis. Um, we also recorded some of the challenges that we faced during our projects, one of which was that we spent a lot of time looking at data sets because none of them seemed to be perfect for the topic that we had in mind. But after we realized that we should probably be more flexible with our ideas, we were able to get past this and choose a data set and kind of work around that instead. When we found an original data set, we noticed that the data was not working for us. So when we tested some algorithms on it, we found it had a poor accuracy rate and it wouldn't have many real world implications. Therefore, we chose to find another data set so we could try to find some real world applications. And also some of us are in different time zones. For instance, I'm in New Jersey and the rest of our team was from California. So some of us were busy when others are free and it was challenging to find time for all of us to meet but we use Discord to communicate regularly and put our code on Google Collab. So we were able to stay in touch with each other about the work. Uh, when we finally figured out a topic, we had limited time to finish the project due to busy schedules and the upcoming presentation. However, we were able to overcome this by scheduling more meetings midweek to give uh, to just meet in general and give feedback to each other. Uh, one thing I got from this experience was analyzing data sets and identifying and removing outliers from it. This definitely helped with not only like machine learning, but more data analysis in general, as it showed me how I can look at different data sets and make it more interpretable for, uh, for general purposes so it can be analyzed better. And something that I got from this experience was because I'm interested in medical field and just science in general, I was able to apply what I learned in AI to the medical field. And that helped me realize that AI can be used basically everywhere. And the future holds a lot for us to discover about computer science. In addition, I learned how to work as a team better. I learned that although I may, I may prefer individual, I may prefer individual coding with big projects like this, it actually helps to delegate different tasks to different team members. So the job can be completed in a much more efficient and quicker manner. From this experience, I learned much about AI. I think that it was very valuable to learn about the difficulties in creating AI, such as finding good data sets and figuring out which models to use, as well as the depth of the AI industry, uh, learning about its practical applications and the different levels of AI complexity. So thank you for everyone uh, for listening to our presentation and thank you to Hack High School for the opportunity and to Misha for your um, a lot of your help that you did for us. Does anyone have any questions? So we worked with um, game development in Python and our group was Python 1 and we learned monopoly. So hi, everybody. My name is Kabir Samsi. I am currently a high school senior, and I was the mentor for one of the two Python game development groups. Um, I'm Alex, and I'm the user interface designer. My name is Alex Reed, and I'm a back, I'm a back end developer. Um, my name is Amazon, and I was a back end developer on Data Lead. Um, and I'm Ashley, and I'm the demo and presentation lead. So our goal for this semester was to create a game that was complex, but left most of the decision making to the players themselves. We decided to go with Monopoly. If you didn't already know, Monopoly is a real estate based board game. 
The player's goal is to regulate their money and assets appropriately while forcing other well, while forcing opponents into bankruptcy through buying and selling through buying and selling of properties. We decided for the sake of, of time that we would use a console base instead of a GUI base. Um, so the game interface and idea. So basically, the um, we decided that we would make our um, user interaction restricted to the same device. So all the players play together on one device. Um, each player would start with the standard amount of money um, to allow the player sufficient time to make decisions. Um, so we, instead of making it an official board that you could see, we used a series of text messages that the player can read and react to and have um, in, and enter input for, for example, questions. Um, so each tile on the board represents an object and property on the board, um, which we've demonstrated in our console. Um, we, use, we utilized our device, the random number generator throughout the game to run functions such as choosing who goes first or how far the travel, the user travels through the game, like for rolling a dice. Um, so how would you play the game? So after each player receives their starting balance on their and their player piece, it basically it just you know, it would randomly choose which player goes first, and then the um, it would give a random number for the amount of spots for which, sorry, for the amount of spaces they would move, like rolling a dice. And if they land on a property that isn't currently purchased, they'll have the option to either buy it or move on, and um. If a player lands on their property, they would automatically gain the rent money that would go towards the owner. Um, and every time a player passes the go tile, they would receive the $200. Um, and different um, and different rewards and handicaps, such as like the chance of community chests or utilities, such as rent railway stations would be one of the tiles available to land on just in the series, like the board. Um, and basically the game just continues until only one player has many left and the, all the others are bankrupt. Okay, so for a quick demo of our game, um, so we got a lot done in the time that we had, but some of the game is still in progress. So you can see that many of the classes and functions still need to be programmed or debugged. Um, so how the game works is when we run it, uh, we first uh, we first ask the player if they want to view the rules and instructions or if they want to start the game. So if we type in one, um, they'll display the instructions. And then after the instructions, the user can enter Y to start the game. Um, we'll need the number of players, um, so three, and then it asks for the player names, so we can say, um, Ashley, Alex, for example. Um, the names are then passed through a class called player that um, creates in a player instance for each individual. Um, within the instance, we keep track of the player's name, their balance, um, the current space on the board, and the number of properties they own, and which properties they are. Um, there's also a role function, as well as other functions. Um, and with, within this role function, we use the, um, the random library to um, determine how many spaces each player goes. Um, so on a turn, a player will have uh, two roles. So this one generated one and four, and then it totals it up to five. So it's just like a real monopoly. Um, the game board is in the form of a tuple, and each tile is um, 
assigned to an instance of different sites based on the real monopoly. So for example, we have a class um, or we have a site class for the properties that are purchasable. And um, we also have other classes for other things like the stations, the company, um, the community chest, and uh, chance cards. Um, so this displays um, role and then which tile the player goes to. And um, so we can press F to pass the turn to the next player. Um, so for now, if the player lands on a site, they are asked if they want to purchase it. And if they say yes, um, the new balance and the new owner of the property is displayed. And basically the game will continue if um, only until only one player remains with money left or if the player inputs end to end the game with this. And afterward, it will return all the um, players in a list that, um, in the order they, that they place. Oh, shoot, sorry. I think I stashed it. So for the product technicals, um, the language we used was Python, the IDE was Visual Studio Code, and then we used the um, random module, and this is all within the monopoly.py file that we collaborated. Okay, so these are some challenges we faced throughout the production of the game. Um, this included time commitment because we were all busy with school and other activities, so we weren't always able to make it to the scheduled meetings on, sun on Saturdays. Um, and we also weren't always working together efficiently near the beginning. We definitely got close to near the end, but for most of the duration of the project, we were working individually. Um, it was also hard to get the project finished because some parts weren't done or we weren't communicating, so we couldn't share progress or go over ideas together. Thus, we weren't able to stick to our original time schedule. Um, it was definitely more difficult because of our inefficient work clock, but I think the key factor was our teamwork and communication. Um, another aspect of the game uh, was the game mechanics. Uh, many program programmers seem to run into a problem when testing the, their code and were really no different. Um, all of us had brief knowledge of Python going into the project, but most of the advanced material we learned um, was, you know, brought in in the past few months. We went through many levels of confusion trying to debug and reprogram our code so it was easy to understand and effective. We went through a complicated process of first receiving the error, then testing out a specific area in our code where we believed the bug was, was by putting a, inputting a print statement, such as in an if statement. Uh, if the print statement was never run when it should have, uh, we knew that there was a problem in that section, uh, in this case, the if statement. So it, it took a lot more time, but we were able to fix several bugs using this method. Okay, so our takeaway from the experience and how it affected us. So in the future, we're planning on continuing this project. We're going to work more efficiently together and um, keep each other updated. We wanted to include a database and save the game's uh, progress so the user can access the game instance the next time they enter the game. Um, and we also hope to include a wow factor. So um, we also hope to include a wow factor and finish developing the game so it can be deployed. Um, specifically for me, I learned how a group works effectively and how it doesn't. Each person has to do their part so the project uh, get fin gets finished. I also learned more about Python through watching Annie and attending our classes. Um, I think I'm going to try to make more Python projects because it seems fun and I enjoy learning about and implementing Python. Um, for me, I learned more about Python and I was able to familiarize myself with its unique syntax and functions um, thanks to the lesson from a mentor. Um, I also learned about working with a group and our um, individual team members' strengths and weaknesses. Um, overall, it was a really fun experience and I hope to be back to make it a finished product. Before we start, oh. Before we start, oh. Sorry. Um, basic, you go first. Before we started on this project, I had absolutely no knowledge on Python. 
So I feel like it was fun to work with like-minded people and, and uh, work on a fun project. Spooky Sense video games is one of my hobbies. Um, before this, I had done a little bit of Python, but I never like worked on like a big project with trying to make something with Python. So it was really cool to learn how you come from like just an idea and then you have to like figure out how to actually make that happen in the different steps that you would need to take. Yeah, thanks for listening. Um, does anyone have any questions? We congratulate all the students um, for their hard work. Uh, thank you also for all of our volunteers. We have people who help us monitoring and administrating our Discord server, which is the platform the students need uh, use to meet uh, and work on their projects on a Saturday. Uh, we also have awesome mentors, Kabir, Carter, Misha, and Sripada. Thank you for your time. Uh, mentors uh, took on their own time to be on Saturday uh, morning or sometimes another day of the week to be with the students and to help them through their project. Um, so really much uh, a lot of uh, great uh, exchange and a lot of hard work. So thank you everyone for making this possible and to go all the way to the finish line. Um, for parents who are out there, um, we are looking for uh, mentors. This, uh, the mentorship that uh, the students receive uh, is what makes Hakka School very special. And um, in not only you know, the mentors help technically um, to provide some tips on how to learn a language, but they also use their professional expertise because they are in the uh, tech field. And so they basically launch project and products all the time. They go through project management. So they provide all of this value as well for the, for the students. If you are in a position where you can uh, be a mentor for Haika School, please um, go to code for fun slash volunteering and uh, put your application and let us know that you want to uh, mentor, um, to be a mentor for high school. Um, we just want, I just want to uh, remind you guys that, you know, we are, um, we are using donations and uh, to fund this project, uh, to fund this program as we want to keep it tuition free so anybody can join. So please contribute if you can uh, at code for fun slash donate and uh, always think about company matching if you can. Uh, with that, uh, I wanted to thank everyone. There will be some more announcements to the students uh, on Discord. So I want to just uh, send thank you again for joining and uh, uh, wish you a happy uh, holiday season. And uh, I will uh, let you know uh, on Discord what's next. If you want to attend Hakai School next year, please submit an application. If you want to uh, be a mentor, please submit a volunteering application. And uh, I hope uh, that everybody uh, will come back from uh, our Hakai School students and finish the year. But if you cannot, uh, that's okay too. Um, we are going to be there for you if you need us. Thank you very much, guys.